Welcome to episode 27 with Tammy Pack. This girl is pure fire, you guys. She's as real as real can get. During today's episode, we talk about Tammy's journey from being a trial lawyer, then how she made the decision of quitting her sure thing job to open a boutique selling quilts. Yes, you guys heard me right, quilts. And now she's a mega successful icon in the real estate industry. Tammy has spoken on the big stage regarding a diverse area of topics, including real estate marketing, using social media and personal branding, leadership, sales skills, and more. In August of 2017, she spoke at Tom Ferry's Success Summit in front of 6,000 realtors in the live audience and around 30,000 people plus watching the live stream. Her YouTube video from that event has been viewed over 400,000 times and counting. You guys are in for a big treat today. This is Unleash Your Inner Legend, a podcast featuring modern day legends sharing their life choices, habits, and routines that got them to where they are today. Get ready to be inspired and to take massive action to unleash your inner legend. All right, you guys, today I have an amazing businesswoman with me today. Welcome, Tammy Pack. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, Holly. Girl, I am so excited to have you on because, yeah, you're just killing it in so many areas like leadership, um, the obvious one, real estate, you're crushing it in social media, personal branding, and that's just some, like just a few to mention. (laughs) Right. It's too many to mention, I think, already. It makes me tired (laughs) even thinking about it. My own life makes me tired. (laughs) I love it, though. And do you have such a phenomenal story. And before I really kind of dig into the meat and potatoes, I know you have so much advice and great tips to give to our listeners. But first, I really want to introduce you to listeners in the way that like, they can understand how you got in the position you are today. Because the Tammy Pack that I know right now chatting with is not the Tammy Pack that was probably, you know, in existence 10 years ago. You know, bet, absolutely. So let's talk about your journey because you literally went from trial lawyer to now you're like this mega real estate icon. So let's just start there about your journey of, you know, let's just fill in the space between those two points of your life. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. I was born in East Texas. I um, went to Abilene Christian University, graduated in 1987. I was always in a hurry. So I finished high school a year early and college year early. So I was two years ahead and I realized that I was barely 20 finishing college and I looked about 11. So my mom said, you better go get some more school and you're too young for anyone to hire. So I said, well, I looked at law school and I said, you know, um, law school's only three years, but I'm two years ahead. So in my mind, I justified it would really cost me one year of my life. So I went ahead and went to the University of Texas Law School and finished there in 1990. Practiced for five years, enjoyed that a lot um, in the trial portions. You know, there were portions I liked and portions I didn't. Um, I did not like studying in the library by myself, uh, working on these cases. I loved being in the courtroom. That was the great part, but that is a small fragment of what you do as an attorney. So, I, you know, and, and the work wasn't bad by any stretch, the writing and all the things you do, but I saw the people that were ahead of me, the senior partners, working even more hours than I was. And at the time, I was 23 to 28 when I practiced, and I thought, how would I ever have kids? How would I have a family when they really want you here all weekend? And even when you are, it's still not enough, you know, and I mean, that's okay. That's you know that going in. That's right. It's a, it's a dog eat dog situation, but there's really not flexibility. So, um, I was, I got married. Well, I, well, I was finishing practicing law. I got married to the father of my children, my ex-husband, great guy. And, um, he was going back to school to study music. He had been in the Marines and well, he would probably correct me and say once a Marine, always a Marine, but, uh, he was going back to get a second degree. And at the time, I went home to Marshall, where I was from, and my mom said, look, she got out a pink clipboard, which if you could see me, you would see I was holding up. I actually keep the clipboard now. It's one of my favorite things. And she kept her daily bookkeeping, everything she had in her little shop on the side of the road on that pink clipboard. So she had started, when I went off to college, because basically I had two older brothers, um, much older, so I was almost an only child. So she knew she was going to really miss me. So she started a little shop on the side of the road, a swap shop 
you'd call it, where she sold antiques if we were being very generous with them. But a lot of times, this was before the days of eBay uh, and really even before garage sales took off. So, you know, to get something used and affordable wasn't as easy as it is today. So she started this shop and um, eventually she started selling quilts. She was selling American made quilts, but they are so expensive, most people couldn't buy them. And the sweet little ladies making them could only make one every few months because they took forever. So she eventually around that same time found quilts, quilts being imported from China and started selling those in her shop. So she was showing me, she, she got this clipboard out and she said, you a lawyer and I make more money than you do. And I just run up and down the road. I got somebody working in my little shop and, and you're working so hard. I said, man, something is wrong with this picture. I've got to try this. So I convinced my husband at the time to give it a whirl. It wasn't just her on the side of the road. I had cousins, aunts, uncles who, after she started this journey, had all gotten into this business and they were either doing shows where they would go out um, to like a can't and trade days. You know, if you're from the area, you know that. Uh, and they would set up once a month and they would sell quilts and that everybody was really having a great time just selling. I think selling runs in our family gene and no one was getting to utilize it yet. <laughs> so I had cousins who were uh, doing it as well, but they, for the most part, they were opening cute little shops in tourist towns. That's how I got to Fredericksburg. They said, well, if you want to do this, the only way we know to do it is to do it in a tourist town. There might be other ways, but this is what we can teach you how to do. So one of my uncles had become an importer and designer through his company of quilts. So I didn't really have, everyone thinks, oh, so it was a family business. I'm like, well, the family was kind of doing it, but it wasn't like you're inheriting a family business. It was like, we'll show you how to do it and we'll sell you some quilts <laughs> on a profit, you know? So my mom, on the other hand, she did help me tremendously in that first 30 days or so. She had more than enough inventory in her store. So she said, look, I'll let you have your first load that I can get from of this certain designer brand and I'll bring them up there and you pay me when you can. So uh, my ex-husband's family uh, lived in Lubbock and still do. And they had a little shop in Post, Texas on the side of the road, Podunk Town, great folks. But literally the only traffic light between Dallas and Lubbock, Texas is in Post. Mm -hmm. And it's a little town of three or 4,000 people. But he said, look, it won't cost you any rent. I got this building because it came with a car wash. I care about the car wash. I don't care about the building. I store a bunch of junk in it. But you guys, if you clean it up and fix it up, you can start there rent free. I thought, I like the price, let's try this. So I quit my job, my ex dropped out of school. I sold my car. I had a Mitsubishi 3000 GT, which was like the coolest car ever. It was <laughs> like the Dodge Stealth, basically. Really loud sports car with quad exhaust pipes, black, it was awesome. And I sold it because I had about $7,500 of equity in it. So I took that and bought my first load of quilts, my mom brought the rest. We started decorating, tagging, setting up a cute little shop in this little junky side of the road place. And we were really lucky. It took off from day one and we sold a lot and we were able to pay her back within less than 30 days and get our own inventory going. Now my ex thought, man, Post is close to my family up in Lubbock and I think we should stay here. And I was like, absolutely, positively, no way. No offense if you're from Post or some other small town, but I just couldn't see that being really what I wanted to spend my whole life doing. And I said, but let's keep this shop and let's follow the plan to go to the tourist town. One of the best stories ever. One night we would, uh, oh, well, yeah, this is what they tell you. If you, want, if you really want to have some grit and you want to make it in business, you've got to be willing to po'boy it, as we called it. And boy, do we po'boy it. My father-in-law had a silver Airstream trailer. That sounds fancy, but in actuality, it was about a 30 year old and it wasn't even an Airstream, it was an Avion. So it was an off brand, but he had it parked behind the little shop that he was letting us use. Well, I mean, they weren't gonna be all fancy and I have hookups or anything to it. So it was just a trailer. We had to move into a small one. And so to go to the bathroom, we would have to get up, unlock the shop during the night and go inside the shop to even use the bathroom. Had a little janky shower they built for us. It was pretty funny, but, you know what, we were able to work around the clock. And the funny thing is, I was like, man, I am working so many more hours than I ever have. And it doesn't feel like work at all. I'm having a blast because I'm doing what I want to do. I have a creative outlet now. I'm decorating. Sometimes I'm thinking financially and I'm getting set up how I'm going to keep track of what I sell and what my profits are. So there was diversity, much like real estate, right? It, it was a lot of work, but it wasn't the same, 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 same with no let up the way law is. So we did that and we would, uh, at night, we would even go into this little shop. It was like 500 square feet, tiny little thing. 
we would go in there and watch TV and hang out because let's face it, it was way bigger than the Avion trailer. So we would put the lights on the quilts that we hung outside in the yard to grab attention. And we would just sit there. And if somebody came in to buy something, great. We had nothing better to do. Uh, at this point, it was hilarious. I would also go to stores like TJ Maxx and Marshalls and look for stuff that was on closeout like it was going into Christmas time. And I'd be ripping the tags off and putting my new price tag on, sell them out of the trunk of the car as quick as I could get them. But this was the mid-90s. You could sell anything. This was uh, uh, November of 1995. This was before like the days of internet where you can price compare and go find it on Amazon and get it tomorrow. It was so. before the days of anything. It was when retail was king and it was pretty amazing. It was so like my favorite awesome. story about that time is we, we went in, we were hanging out inside the shop at night because what else are you going to do? The ex did not want to go to Fredericksburg because he put down too many roots there near his family. And I did because that was always the plan is to go big with this thing. And this random guy comes in off the street one night and he, he comes in, he goes, man, this is a, it's like eight at night, but we're sitting there watching TV. What else are you going to do? He goes, this is really, man, y'all got some cute stuff in here. You know where y'all would be good? Fredericksburg. And we're like five hours from Fredericksburg in this location, if you can picture Texas. And of course, I just looked at him and I was like, mm, and my ex was like, I'm never going to win this, am I? No, because now the Fredericksburg angel came off the street at eight o'clock at night and said, you should be in Fredericksburg. <laughs> so we did. So we came down here in uh, January of 96. We ended up over the years with as many as six retail locations selling quilts, home decor, bedding, accessories, and... Um, then we'd shrink and grow depending. We had a store in Bernie and one in Green at one point. We kept the one in Post for a while, three in Fredericksburg. Uh, eventually toward the end, we got down to where we had the one big shop. Just like in real estate, you guys have probably all told people, real estate life's a lot like Monopoly. You start with little greenhouses and you trade them in for big red hotels. So we started with these little shops, renting them. And over time, we got the opportunity to buy a building. So that ended up being our flagship store, and we kept that till 2015. Now, here comes the overlap. So along the time, around 2014, I guess, I got divorced. In 2014, I also met my husband, Wes. Sounds sketchy, but it wasn't. It just took a long time to get the <laughs> divorce. It really wasn't, I promise. <laughs> met him online, because I also thought it's going to take me two or three years to find some. I was 47 at the time, 52 now. I said, it's going to take forever to meet anybody decent. And I would just like to go have dinner. That's it. No big deal. Well, of course, the third person I had dinner with was Wes. And I never looked back. And the other two even were lovely gentlemen. They just weren't for me. Met him and almost immediately. I mean, he was the one. So I met him in August. Did not think this would happen. But got married the following January of 2015. Good news, bad news is he lives about 100 miles away at the time in Georgetown, a suburb of Austin. And he's trying to talk me into going up to Georgetown because it's a really cute town. And I'm going up there and visiting and I'm bringing him down where I am. And I'm thinking, I've got to show him the way, right? Which is that Fredericksburg is the coolest. Number one, I've got several businesses here going, right? I've got the quilt stores and I'd already gotten the B&B &B thing, which we can back up later and talk about if you want. So I had a reservation service, B&B &B, and a retail store. And my two daughters weren't quite finished with high school. So clearly we needed to be in Fredericksburg, but I did not want to be, you ladies know what I'm talking about that are listening. I did not want to be that woman that told him what he needed to do. And he ever looked back, right? We both had lies. He had been married before. This needed to be his decision. And I was crazy enough about him that if I had to visit him in between while the girls graduated and, and run the businesses from Georgetown, I would have done it before I let him go. So we very just casually figured it out, you know? He did not actually give notice and move to Fredericksburg from his good job he had until uh, June of 2015. So we were just playing it by ear, 100 mile commute back and forth, figuring it out. You, you know, you don't ever want to be the one that told him or forced him versus leading him to it and saying, if you think it's going to be great for you, then this is great. Like most people, he'd had some rough knocks with, you know, life and wives and situations. And I said, for all he knows, I'm another lunatic, and he's going to give up this job, which his story's incredible. This guy had gone from getting divorced, walking away, saying, I don't care. I don't want a thing. Just let me out because I will live in my car for a week, and it won't take me long. I'll be back on my feet. This is a year before I met him, basically, a year, year and a half. So in that amount of time, he had literally spent a week living in his car, but he said, I know if I can get a job in the door. Um, so he took a job at Tilson Homes, building a custom homes here in Texas. He goes, I think I can do something there. His background with his family, been in building, you know. 
and he took a job. He said it was either 12 or $14 an hour, like opening up model homes and sweeping. And he said, you know, and he's in his late forties at this point has had a successful career sales manager at Corral, lots of different things, but he's really got out of that marriage with his, by the skin of his teeth. So he said, if I can get in the door, this is probably, this may be his story. Maybe the one thing you guys take away from this, forgetting everything I'm going to say. He said, if I can get in the door, I know I'm going to impress him. I'm going to show up first. I'm going to stay longest. I'll always have a smile. I'm going to work hard. It's going to be the best employee they've ever had. And I'm going to move up. And by the time I met him in about a 15 to 18 month time, he had gone from sweeping the floors to the head of the entire division and making a six figure income in that amount of time from living in his car. That's amazing. That's, That's what hard work and grit and knowing your worth will do. And he said, you know, I let myself feel sorry for myself for about a day. And I thought, forget this noise. He's like, I bought some peanut butter. Cause I, you know, could have that. And I think his mom even loaned him a car to use for a while. He walked out with nothing. He said, just let me out. And, but you know, if you've got that grit and you give customer service and you are good, believe in yourself and go out there and don't just wallow and wait for somebody else or blame somebody else. He pulled himself up by his bootstraps. And by the time I met him, you see where I'm going with this. I was like, I can't be the one after what he just went through to tell him he needs to quit that job and move to Fredericksburg. Right. Cause he really reinvented himself in a quick period of time. So he needed to see it. Cause what if I'm another nut job? And here he, you know, walks out with nothing and he just rebuilds himself. So luckily he trusted me, took a chance on me and it's all worked out well. But I, I knew I had to come up with something. He was a worker. He was never the kind of guy that was going to come here and be a kept man taken care of by me, you know, in my businesses that he would walk into. That wasn't, you know, I'm using my old, old people language here because I'm old. <laughs> I'm <kept man. laughs> These days it's much more modern. It's fine as long as either person works. But, <laughs> but he was, he, he was a hardworking guy and he still is. So I finally came up, I'd had my real estate license since 2008 or 2009, but really just for myself. Mm -hmm. So I told him, look, I've been turning away real estate work for a long time. And with Tilson, what was he doing? Heading up the division. He was selling houses, new custom bills. Cause he's very talented, very artistic. He was putting plans in CAD, CAD and making changes to the blueprints and overseeing the building. But I said, you're selling houses. He goes, yeah, I've actually taken the real estate course. I just didn't take the test. All he had to do was take the test. I had a license and for years since we had a B&B service, people buying B&Bs here would come in and say, do you know of any good B&Bs to sell that, you know, that we could purchase or other realtors would send them and say, we don't know if this is a good one or not. Y'all go talk to Tammy and them over at Absolute Charm. And so we would tell them how great the property was um, on the hopes that we could then represent it as a reservation service, right? And get 20% in that way. That was the upside to us if it all worked out. It got to the point where some of my employees said, you know, I spend probably eight hours a week uh, training other realtors, clients on what they don't know. And that's nothing bad against them. I don't know everything about every area of real estate, right? No one can, but we had all the data, all the knowledge. I had a license and no way to run another business by myself. But when I met Wes, I said, have I got the deal for us? <laughs> and that's how Absolute Charm was born. That's awesome. That's an amazing story. So you went from, and I think like some big key takeaways, really just listening from your story, you and uh, Wes's story is like really focusing on happiness because here's the deal. Like there are people out there that are lawyers that absolutely are happy doing that, but absolutely. you weren't like, it didn't sound like you were very um, excited to sit in, you know, like you said, that's like the worst part sitting alone, studying and all that other stuff, yes. which was the majority of the of the um, title of what you were holding. So it's going back to happiness and always finding a way. Cause who would have thought that like someone as a lawyer could turn around and sell quit quilts. I mean like that's literally the, like the pivot point that like, I would never have guessed that like lawyer, real estate, that makes sense. Cause it's almost kind of <laughs> hand in hand, but like to see that stop in between, that just kind of shows everyone that like, if you have a passion and you find that creative outlet that fulfills you, go for it. And then, yeah, and before we even go on Holly, cause I think you, you hit on a great point. Um, I actually have one of my YouTube series on my YouTube channel, search Tammy pack, um, is like sales skills. Uh -huh. And I literally go through how sales are sales are sales. And I, I know a lot of realtors that don't know how to sell. Mm -hmm. They may know how to write a contract or to do a listing, 
but I, I know because I have a show with them and they will open their mouth and the video series is quit killing sales. Cause my mom taught me cause she taught me everything I need to know about selling quilts, selling in general. Cause she didn't care about quilts. No one in my family ever made a quilt. This was just a widget, right? A house, a car, I don't care. And she would give me the most practical advice. And you'll see me go through this series on things like, you know, you got to find out who the decision maker is mm -hmm. and you've got to appeal to what they care about while still showing respect and body language that includes the other person. Um, she said, you, she'd always say, you're going to know when you kill a sale. One of the examples I give, and I think it's so much more useful in real estate than almost anything you've probably learned in a, in most courses, you know, we know those are usually worthless, like a, like a real estate course <laughs> is I'll never forget. I, I said, you've got to learn biggest problem, especially with buyer's agents to make distinctions without judgment, show differences without putting opinion on it. In other words, I was gonna to try to sell this person. I had a couple of quilts out on the bed. We'd gotten that far. It's pretty good salesman with this thing. And I thought I got this down. She said, well, I like this one or this one. I said, well, look at this one. It's got a beautiful sawtooth border, which is like a zigzag border. That's a lot more work when you're sewing. I knew this not from sewing, but from learning from my mama, what she told me about selling. And then the other one had a real straight border. Those are cheaper, simpler. You can imagine cutting that straight, that's easier. So I pointed out, I said, see, this one has a beautiful sawtooth border. Whereas this one, you know, this is much plainer and easier and cheaper. As my mom told me, she said, you'll see it on their face the minute you kill the sale. This is true with the house. Literally the person looks, she goes, oh, you know, you're, you're right. And I, that's the one I liked. So the one she liked, I just called plain. Mm -hmm. And now she's not confident enough, which half the buyers aren't, to buy what she wanted. And I could tell her face changed and there was no amount of backing up, beep, 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 gonna take away what I had just called it. And I couldn't save that sale. But I learned from then on, and this works in real estate, from then on when I got the same two quilts out, I would say, look at the intricate detail border on this. This is incredible. That's so much workmanship. And then look at this one. This clean, simple line is so refreshing. You see the difference on those 10 words? Absolutely, and I think, um for those listening, maybe you are too as well, uh, familiar with Donald Miller. He's the story brand guy. And he makes the distinction of like, it's not about you. It's about okay. you. You're not the hero. You're the guy. Guess what people, guess what people really want you to do, whether yep. you're selling them a quilt, a car, or a house. They want you to reinforce and tell them that what they already like and want to buy is correct. Yes, you're just guiding them. You're not trying to save them. And now, something's obviously got a, a, I'm not saying it's got a waste pit that you know about. I'm saying when they're choosing cosmetically between this and this, they really want you to convince them and make them feel good about the one they're leaning toward. I called hers plain. Yep. And, that, and now she doubts herself. So I see buyer's agents come in and think it's their job to point out everything they don't like about it. And I'm going, what's it to you? If she likes laminate countertops that are peach, hush. You know, you say, absolutely, man, those are retro. That's so in, that's cool. Whatever. What do you care? You're not being dishonest. You're just validating their taste. Absolutely. And it's going back to them. And you know, another thing that really stuck out when you're talking about like your journey of becoming, you know, the person you are today is you have made sacrifices and this is, it was, it's great because you made sacrifices on the state of living on what car you were driving. However, I can tell you guys right now, Tamra Pack does not live in a, in a trailer with no utility right now. So like you, you took those sacrifices, you did what was possible. You, you know, saved where you needed to save, you invested where you need to invest. But then also that realizing too, is like, this isn't, this is temporary. You had that mindset of, okay, this is what I've got to do now to get to where I want to be. Versus a lot of people either they hold themselves in that nine to five job that they hate because of the nice car that comes along with it. But here's the deal. It's like in the next 10 years, that car is going to be an old car and there's going to be newer models out there. And what are you going to be doing to, to get those and to get that freedom? And at I some point you have to take a leap, right? And yes. I don't care who you are. I, I've, I've got a couple of agents here, at least two I can think of that went from full-time jobs to selling straight commission. And mm -hmm. finally you told them, you know, you're going to make it when you make it and it's going to come in lumps. But at some point, if we don't help you get out of the nest and go do it, you'll never do it. And they both look back and go, I'm making so much more. This is great, but it's scary. Embrace the fear, do everything you can. If you got to move home, if you got to sleep on the couch, whatever you could do, 
that would allow you to follow your dream and go for it all the way, do it. But then don't go spend money on stupid stuff when you're just starting out and you can't afford it yet, right? Yes, absolutely. And creating those fake identities. And that's another point I want to bring up about you because I feel like with ever since day one that I've met you, you've been consistent with your personality, with your brand. You're just congruent as to your core values and then also who you are showing up online and offline. So well, it's a lot easier, right? I mean, you got, you better stay consistent. <laughs> they said it's easier. They said, I can't imagine being a liar. How do you keep up with all that? You know, just be who you are. Now I'm not saying you don't adopt a little bit of an alter ego. You know, everyone can do that to a degree. And if you're really shy and sales are hard, you can adopt the alter ego. It's not a, it's not an, a disingenuous side of yourself. You're tapping into that side of you that's able to do it. And you're focusing on being that, but that's, that's all. Yes, absolutely. And you know, let's talk about that a little bit because I feel like so many people are out there trying to build up their personal brand and trying to do this in a society where it's, you know, everybody's fighting for attention. So what are some tips you can give to listeners regarding personal branding and how they can really truly build themselves as you know, the expert in their industry, but then also infuse their personality and their uniqueness within it to create that efficient personal brand? That's a great question. And you know, the truth is we say everybody's out there competing for attention, but it's really not that hard. I got to tell you now, Coca-Cola is an Adidas or Adidas as they call it in England is uh, those kind of companies are, but look around the normal people, you know, I, you know, I've got a team I work with here, a lead and we have these conversations all the time and they'll be like, Oh, somebody didn't like that. You said this or that. And I have to say this, or somebody didn't like people are terrified to put themselves out there. So I got to tell you in 2020, the field is wide open. If you're willing to do and say things that a lot of people will love and a few people won't. And people are terrified of it. They're so scared because I hear it all the time. Oh, well, so-and-so said this or that. I'm like, yes. And what about the other 500 people that loved it? I yep. cannot please everyone or, you know, we hear it all the time, but it's true. If you're for everyone, you're for no one. You've got to have, and, and I never, I'm kind of an old fashioned Southern gal. So I'm, I never uh, encourage anyone to be discourteous or unkind, but I'm going to tell the truth the way I see it. And if I don't do that, people get bored. If Absolutely. I tell the truth the way I see it, they like it. Now, does, do they all like it? Shoot. No, there's always somebody that's upset, but we, Everybody I know focuses on the one or the two or the three that are upset and not the hundreds that like what they do. The other thing that I couldn't emphasize more, it happens every day for me. People who follow you on social media, whereas, which is where I've built so much of my brand, most of them, the vast majority, I would love to see the stats someday, are quiet. Yep. The vast majority that eventually call me and give me $5 million listings, $6 million listings, the huge hotel operation I went and talked to yesterday. I did not know he and I were even friends on Facebook. I didn't know his name from Facebook, but he knew everything about me and my life. Yep. Every little detail. And so I'm thinking there, you don't realize you worry about that. You got 10 or 15 people liked it. One person fussed about something and didn't like it but there were 250 that quietly sat back and took note. The guy that called me for a $5.8 million listing to this day, I've never seen him like or comment anything. And he knew my whole life. He knew where I was, where I'd been, what I was doing. And he chose me completely because of that. He did. So just quit worrying about that one or two. Cause you know what? That's great news to me. Whenever I look around at people that are going, well, somebody wouldn't like it. I said, great. You just stay scared. Absolutely. I think it's also, you're going to attract the people who you actually do want to work with because here's the deal. If you put out something that people don't like, you probably don't want to work with them anyways, because they don't like you as a person. Right. Right. We, we need to be a good fit. It's a two way street. And I tell people that I don't expect everyone naturally just to automatically like me or care about me, but, but you do have to be willing to embrace that. And it's, it's really hard for people. It's hard for everyone. Mm -hmm. My daughter even told me the other day and because I love it. She's a great barometer for me because she's brutally honest. I take her on a listing appointment. Must be the heavy hand because she's like, you'll never get that. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm so sorry she said that, you know, but she even is always brutally honest. And she goes, don't forget mom. Whenever you say that you're building so much and getting listings because of social media, you're encouraging the team to do it. She goes, don't forget, you are the team leader. You're a lawyer. You're all these things. I said, stop writing your tracks because she's usually very self-aware. I said, we are all something. We're all something good. We have upsides, downsides. 
you are whatever in this world you create and I am not even messing around. And I pick up my phone, I go, that was never the truth, but you look at these cell phones because of this, this is the ticket to Hollywood back in the day and you are whatever you want. I splashed up on the screen that picture, you've seen it before the before and after from 2012 when I looked crazy compared to now. And I said, I was a business owner and an attorney back then. I was all these things back then. I decided to recreate me in this modern age and everybody out there can. I said, yes, I have those things, but guess what? You're young and you're doing well in sales. You can be that 20 under 20 who does this and this and this. Someone who's a little older is just starting in real estate. People take a look at you. They assume you know something whether you do or not. Find your benefit and build on it. So it's just an excuse to say you can do it because and that's why I love that post. I was like, really? Look at me at 47 versus 52. I've taken ownership and responsibility to build my brand. And I'm not gonna say you have to do that by changing your appearance or whatever you want, but whatever it is you wanna be, quit making excuses and do it. Absolutely. And uh, that particular video that you're talking about was definitely inspirational. So you guys have to go and search on Tammy Pack. It's titled how to lose, I'm sorry, how to look better in seven years. And is that available also on your YouTube channel? I need to make sure if it's not, I will. <laughs> okay, cool. Perfect. So you guys make sure, and I'll also connect the links too in the show notes so that you guys listening can go and easily click on that from your iTunes or whatever platform you're listening to this on. You got to just emphasize how, how, you know, if you listen to Gary Vaynerchuk, and I know you do, how revolutionary this is. We, we're already starting to take it for granted, but 10, 15 years ago, I had very limited ability to change you know, myself, but my, my ability to reach the world 15 years ago, 20 years ago was almost zero. Now, if I choose by using that cell phone and the tools that are mostly free, you're starting on a low budget. This is the low budget way to do it. You can get out there and build an audience that cares about you personally. The people that reach out, okay, y'all will laugh at this. I had a lady reach out the other day about a $1.2 million listing and she's trying to move it from another agent over to me. She goes, I know I should have used you, but I know him from, uh, from church. And I felt like I had to, but she wasn't talking about anything I do in real estate. She kept going, I just loved your makeup video down in Houston. I, all she wanted to talk about was my hair and makeup yeah. videos. She liked me as a person or thought she did, right? If, as long as I'm genuine, once she really meets me and she, she wanted to work with me guys in, in a lot of industries and real estate is the best example I know of it. We're a ketchup bottle on a shelf yep. and we better find a way to distinguish ourselves. We often charge very similarly. And so why shouldn't they choose someone they might be attracted to as a human being and think I wouldn't mind riding around the car with them or working with them. They do good things for the community. You fill in whatever it is about you because otherwise they just pick the guy beside you. You've got to not be so focused. That's the realtor's biggest mistake is, and maybe some of the, I'm sure every career, I'm sure mortgage lenders, everyone is only want to talk on your business page about your business and you yep. wonder why you can't get traction. Absolutely. Tammy, you are incredible. And thank you so much for being just vulnerable, being real and, you know, just authentic. Just being I, It's the only way to be. <laughs> and I tell people, if you can't go comment and post and be, say things nice, then we got a whole different problem, right? So authentic needs to be a decent person. If you're a decent person, which I know you are, each of you out there, then embrace that, go to the extreme with it and quit being scared. I love it. So Tammy, for those listening that aren't following you just yet, but they want to maybe catch your adventures with your gorgeous cats or your makeup tutorials or your motivational videos or even just simply real estate how can they follow you if uh, under most of my channels i'm under tammy pack talks and it's t-a-m-m-y pack like you pack a suitcase and talks like you hear me yammering here and if it's not it's just plain tammy pack it's one of the two so i'm not hard to find Awesome. Thanks again so much for showing up and just inspiring everyone. And I am grateful for your time spent on this podcast episode. Same to you, Holly. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Unleash Your Inner Legend. For more inspiration, make sure to subscribe by going to UnleashYourInnerLegend.com. We'll see you guys next week.